Hello there. As part of the global farmer fight back against the establishment, British farmers will very soon hold their largest protest so far in central London. Across the world, the people are waking up to the vast net zero driven economic damage being inflicted on them and voicing ever louder concerns about it and anger. But are our WEF driven political masters really listening? With the only thing between net zero geddon and sanity being the sterling work of our hard pressed farmers to keep the public's attention on what net zero is going to do to our food security. Farmers Weekly is reporting that farmers are planning to descend on Westminster on Monday the 25th of March. Plans are already being made for farmers to drive dozens of tractors and farm vehicles to the capital for a 6pm start on the day, it says. Now to be clear, these farmers have three main aims. To lobby the government to ditch trade deals with Australia and New Zealand, which are a bad deal for British farming and farmers. To pressure the Houses of Parliament to introduce legislation to ensure that supermarkets can no longer have contracts that pay producers below the cost of production. To demand the government deliver a food plan to protect and bolster domestic food security. Now, on the face of it, none of that appears to be directly linked to net zero. But in reality, they all are. For example, pushes by governments to plant trees on arable land and rewild some of it will remove 20% of farmland and make agriculture more expensive and hit farming yields. So reducing our food security. Any new agriculture plan would have to remove that sort of nonsense. And then there's the drive to remove fuel subsidies that will make it so much more expensive to produce food in the UK, thus encouraging people to buy possibly inferior produce from elsewhere in the world. That does not bolster our food security. It just fills someone else's coffers. The UK needs to grow everything that it can grow here in the UK. We need to find ways to produce more food for domestic consumption and export, not try to impoverish the country. And all imports of food must be able to match the same standards that our farmers have to fork money out to meet. Leaving the EU never meant reducing food standards. Our post-Brexit food standards should remain as high as necessary to protect the consumer. And importing food costs in carbon miles, so the eco-nutters should be anti-that anyway. Then there's the fertiliser issue. The production of nitrogen fertilisers takes a lot of energy and a lot of natural gas. For example, one fertiliser company, Yarra, is planning to build a new fertiliser factory in Yorkshire. And it states on their website that they use natural gas as a component to produce ammonia, a critical component in fertiliser production. I've put a link in the descriptions box below to a very informative video Yarra made on this subject. But at the end of the day, when energy costs and the cost of natural gas is high, fertiliser becomes too expensive for farmers to use, once again hitting farming yields. We need cheap natural gas for cheap fertiliser for cheap, plentiful, high quality food. It's that simple. So net zero is intricately tied up in agriculture. And so is the use of natural gas. Now, we have heard some soft talk from the EU about slowing the push to net zero down. Maybe by allowing the sale of new petrol and diesel cars to extend beyond 2035. Or was it 2030? It's hard to keep track of all this nonsense. And now we hear that the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is talking about building more gas-powered power stations so as to keep the lights on as we transition to net zero. 
Writing for the Telegraph, Sunak said we need gas to back up renewables to cater for the times when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine. No Sherlock. And I gather more North Sea gas drilling licences have been issued. Hallelujah, I hear you cry. But in reality, this is all about putting clear blue water between Tory energy insecurity policy and Labour's disastrous energy non-security policy. He's gearing up for an election, which he'll lose anyway, but at least he might be able to salvage a couple of seats by talking this way. But he's actually failed on that one anyway. The Labour Party is also now talking about the need for gas going forwards. But they are both still fully committed to ditching coal, oil and gas by 2050. So where will our fertiliser come from then? Imported natural gas or just importing the fertiliser? How is that net zero and how is that energy security or food security? They are both just trying to butter the electorate up. And I fear that's the same in the EU. Remember, they have EU Parliament elections over there in June. Maybe they're just trying to ease that through a bit. Now, the hard truth is that unless our net zero laws are changed, then this is just talk. We are bound into net zero by 2050 by both national and international law. We've already had the likes of Just Stop Oil activists getting let off in court because their cause was saving the planet and on the basis that the government was failing to follow its own laws with regard to reducing carbon emissions. Every single new gas power plant will be met by ferocious physical and legal attacks at every turn. And without a change in the basics of net zero laws, those attempts to stop the new gas powered plants will be successful. And the government lawyers will be well aware of this. Therefore, so will our Rishi. Unless he's a complete plank. Already we've had environmentalist and TV presenter Chris Packham earlier this month announcing that he's been given the all clear to go to court for a judicial review in the High Court on Sunak's delay to the ban on no new petrol and diesel cars after 2035. Without a change in the net zero laws, all Sunak will do is rack up huge legal bills for the UK taxpayer to underwrite while at the same time changing zero about net zero. And it won't matter which of the red or blue variety of government we have, it will still be net zero by 2050. All achieved by shutting down our power production and switching the power off to our homes when there isn't enough electricity to go around. As well as limiting how far you can drive in your precious electric vehicle. And if either the EU or the UK want to walk back on net zero, they will both have to agree to amendments to the post-Brexit trade and cooperation agreement, because the agreement contains climate and emissions non-regression clauses. As do all those international agreements we keep signing up to whenever there's another set of climate COP talks. And because the UK is this huge beacon of obeying the rule of law, then the courts will stymie any attempt to water down net zero at every turn. Any political party that goes into the next general election without a firm commitment in its manifesto to actually change these laws, then any claims they make before or afterwards are just hot air. Net zero hot air. These net zero obviously think we'll all be working in service industries from home and having our shopping delivered to us by flying pink unicorns. Our political masters from the UN and WEF downwards to our so-called sovereign parliament and local councils are totally wedded to this disastrous policy of shutting down our economy just so they can virtue signal at our cost.